interested parties, my name is Christopher Powers. And I'm Tim Leon. And Marissa is filming for us today. We are here to introduce or explain in more detail our project for Boston University ECE, which is a smart grid test facility. Pretty much, in essence, it is a surrogate power grid to demonstrate power engineering fundamentals and techniques to students here at Boston University. So what you see here is the top of our project. This is mostly what students interact with when they use our project to learn about the fundamentals of power engineering. Uh, let me point out some key uh, features here. So we have here to our left along as well as the top and to the right mock transmission lines. Then we have the R, L, and C load boxes that can be used. And then here we have an example of our sensing board that attaches into a lab jack, which is seen right here, that the students can collect data from. So here is one of our transmission lines. It is, it is modeled off of real world RLC characteristics, and here we modeled a conductor size of 115 kV, 750 MCM diameter aluminum cable for our PCB right here. We have six switches on the board to allow power flow across four different directions from one side to the other. When I flip the switch downwards, that switch is off and non-conducting. So in our modeling of the RLC transmission lines, we try to do our calculations per unit length. Here we have a 10 mile transmission line, a 25 mile simulation, another 25 mile simulation, and a 50 mile transmission line. In these T lines, we have resistance and inductance in series, and in parallel, we have capacitors. I already mentioned the sensor board. I thought I'd go into a little more detail about how it works and what it's used for. So, pretty much, the sensor connects into two Tamiya ports that can be found all along the grid, along the transmission lines, the load boxes, and also the generator itself. The student will be able to connect this anywhere, anywhere he or she wants it to be, and then we'll be able to read signals based on that. So here's how it works. The student connects the Tamiya plugs into wherever he or she wants it, then current goes through the plugs into an Allegro ACS 712 Hall effect sensor, which generates a signal based on how much current goes through it. It centers around 2.5, but we design it to go between 2 and 3 based on how much current we see at the time. When it, feeds, when it goes through the sensor, the output from the sensor is picked up by a TL0A2 op amp and a TL0A4 op amp, which converts the signal to a usable one that can be seen by the lab jack, which is then processed by MATLAB. In addition, instead of just the only current, you can also gather the voltage signals by just doing simple analog manipulation also through the TL0A2 and TL0A4 to the output. The ACS 712 is fed by an LM2937 5 volt voltage regulator, which is plugged into the same 15, negative 15 volt source that the op amps use for analog manipulation. What you see in front of you is our R, L, and C load boxes. Pretty much the way they work is they act in similar ways to a binary box, where based on the value of the switches on or off, you can adjust the value to what you want to test. So pretty much what we have here is an R box with just simple quarter watt transistors, an L box with hand wound inductors, and a C box with electrolytic capacitors. It was noted before that electrolytic capacitors is not good for AC, we agree. We're looking at sourcing basic ceramic capacitors that have enough capacitance for us right now in order to provide an updated version for students who use this in the future. To operate the load boxes is very simple. All a student has to do is plug it into the grid wherever they want and then they flip the appropriate switches to get the value they want. For example, 
For the R box, if you wanted to attach a 1K, you would only flip this switch right here and it will give you one kilo ohm resistance through this box. If you wanted 3K, flip this switch and this switch and you get 3K. 7K, flip this switch. 5K, flip this switch off, so on and so forth. This is bit 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, indicating 255 different combinations. This is universal through all the load boxes. However, the volumes obviously change from ohms to henrys to farads. This red machine here is our reference generator. It is one of our three AC generators on the grid that we have on top of the cart. It produces exactly 12 volts peak onto the grid. On the left here, we have our 24 volts DC side top power supply produced by Siemens. Uh, right beneath that, you can see one of our buck converters and our chip, the MSP430, that is coded to provide feedback for our generation system for both generators, generator A and generator B that's located on the bottom of our cart. Here we have the second buck converter and the second MSP430. Okay, so as I mentioned, the 24 volt DC power supply powers these black DC motors. We have two of them on the bottom of our cart. They are 24 volt DC, 2.6 amp DC motors. You can see they're connected via a belt drive to the red machines, which are our AC alternators, that immediately produce 17 volts AC. So our two transformers have a step-down windings ratio of approximately 2 to 1. The immediate voltage output of our alternators is 17 volts RMS, and we're stepping down both alternators to 8 volts RMS, which is the uniform voltage on our grid. So here are our two oscilloscopes to measure voltage on our grid. And to the left we have the two DC power supplies that provide 5 volts for our encoders that are connected direct drive to our generators and 3.3 volts DC for our MSP430 feedback chips. Now that we've showed each of the components on our grid, we're going to show our grid in action now. So I'm going to start off by turning on our reference generator that will provide 12 volts peak to the top of our delta transmission network. Then I'm going to follow by turning on the 24 volt DC supply down here that will power our two 24 volt DC motors. So now that we have the reference generator on, we want to synchronize two more generators to our grid to make it a real power grid. Uh, so to do that, we're going to press uh, the on button on the MSP430 for generator A, uh, and that will start uh, the alternator turning. Uh, now it is feeding into the synchronization circuit that Tim will talk about. Now we're syncing generator A to the reference generator. Here is one of our synchronization circuits. It consists of a sync bulb and a disconnect switch in parallel. As you can see, the LED bulb is blinking on and off. When the bulb is dark, that means the line-to-line -line voltage is equal to zero coming from both sides of the sync circuit. And when the bulb is on or bright, that means that there is voltage across these two terminals. When I close this disconnect switch, it will be when the LED is off, meaning that the two waveforms are in phase. Then you'll see the two waveforms merge into one uniform system voltage, AC. So I film it for like five, six seconds so that they can see the way it moves and then I'll see. So now we're going to add generator B onto the system. So we already have two generators that are feeding into the grid at the same time. We're adding a third, um, which is what we'll do right here. We'll also mention that these buttons um, the two can change the frequency output of this alternator just slightly by about 0.2 hertz of each press. That can make synchronization just a little bit easier for students, so that option is available to them if they like to use it. Um, so by pressing the button on the MSP as we did before, we'll turn on the second generator. And now we'll sync generator B with the rest of our grid. Again, we'll do the same thing with our synchronization circuit, and when the bulb is off, or is dark, the line-to-line -line voltage is zero, and the two waveforms are in phase, right 
now. So, now we have three AC generators powering our transmission network. So now we'll go ahead and connect different loads. Uh, and the students have four loads available to them that we've designed, and they also have the option to make their own and add them as they'd like. So right here, I'm connecting in a load uh, into one of the transmission lines. This is our sicko sign. Um, each transmission line has two load connection points that go chop off straight to ground. Um, here, here, and here. Uh, and so I've chosen this one uh, as our connection point. And we're from Boston, we love the sicko sign, so, <laughs> so this is one of the loads that we made. Students can also use uh, various other loads that we've generated that we talked about earlier, um, such as the resistive box. So you can go ahead uh, and plug in to any of the connectors uh, and energize that. Um, at the moment, you really don't see a difference with this. With our sensor network, that's really where you start to observe um, what kind of power flow is going through that load or how power flow changes, um, what kind of current is being provided by the generators as a result of the various load networks. All right, now for the sensor boards. As we mentioned before, the sensor can connect to anywhere in the grid that a student can want it. So say, for example, I wanted to measure the power consumption of the Citgo sign that we have here to determine the voltage, current, power factor, etc. So to set that up, We'll just disconnect the sicko sign real quick and plug in the sensor in series with where it used to be between the transmission line and the sicko sign. All student has to do is just connect the Tamiya connectors in. Attach the signal. Then finally attach power. and you're ready to measure. To measure, the sensor board sends an analog signal through the wire to a LabJack U3 LV that you see right here, which with a 50 kilohertz sample signal would then send data to whatever Windows compatible computer you want with MATLAB via USB 2.0. So on Hackaday, we had mention of our Legos. Uh, for the most part, they don't really serve a true purpose other than the fact that we like to have fun here at Boston University ECE. So in order to make our project more approachable, we decided to add them along with our buddy Doug down here, which is our team mascot, and also we have a boat. All right, so we had some questions asked about what exactly we can see on our grip. Um, for the most part, you can simulate anything from outages to just generation faults, so on and so forth. So, one example would be what would happen if we were to disconnect and reconnect one of our generators seen either Generation A or Generation B temporarily off the grid and on the grid. What would happen in real life is the generator would get out of sync and then the energy it sends back into the system will come back and hit it and it might actually fall apart, just like what was demonstrated with the Aurora Generator test in 2007. Um, we've never done this before. We do not know what's going to happen. Just, let, just to let you know, this actually is happening live. So, to make sure that everything is in order, both switches are on, they're in sync right now. We're gonna see what happens when I switch, put one of the switches off and then back on again. It should ha happen to be out of sync, but if it does fall in sync, we'll do it a couple times. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn sync A off, which is the A generator, which if you look down below, is this one to the left. Alright, so off. You might not have caught it, but the motor actually spun up faster until I reconnected it to the grid and then it slowed down and stayed in sync. This means that the power is getting transferred to the grid, it's not taking it. So let's see what happens again if I can do it for longer. And then let's just sync it back up. What would happen if something like, say, a tree fell on one of our mock transmission lines? 
Obviously we're indoors, there's no trees, but we have the next best thing, which is just a simple switch. So, in order to simulate that, all you have to do is disconnect whatever switch is currently hot at sending the voltage through the line, and you can see what happens with our sensor. So, for this transmission line in particular, what we have is a 25 mile line. It's currently on. To simulate that, all we got to do is switch this off and then see what happens. Now it's only connected to the 10 mile line and the 25 mile line is off. If we want a total power outage, we just disconnect the 10 mile line. Say we restore power automatically, just turn it back on. Alright, as you can see, this is meant to be a learning tool. It's very basic. Based, a lot of electrical engineering students will understand it very easily, especially if you take a power course such as energy systems, power electronics, so on and so forth. Now, it is called Smart Grid Test Facility, but there's nothing essentially smart with it right now that is going to happen in the future. Right now, we are envisioning different sorts of things, such as wireless communications, microcontroller-based relay systems, uh, three-phase operation, amongst other things, including possibly patching into 802.11 networks that a student can possibly see what happens if you were to jumble around with different relays on just a simple laptop from other areas on campus.